Welcome to Second Take, the show that focuses on the issues behind the news. It's been another extreme week on the electricity front with stage five load shedding, the resignation of Andre Dereta, and some dramatic NASA postponements. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss this traumatic period. Hi, Terence. Ah, Sashni. Now, the big news is undoubtedly Andre Dereta's resignation. Yes, I think it, it's not a surprise, but it still leaves the country in some, some somewhat shaken. Uh, he has been a, sort of there for the last three years, one of the longest tenors of a CEO that we've had in recent years. And I think the final straw really came when I think that, that he doesn't feel he was getting the political or the support of his board. I think um, the reckless statements of the energy minister, mm -hmm. Gwede Montash, around uh, uh, load shedding being tantamount almost to treason and that Eskom must get under control was, was quite an extreme statement. Really, I think about Gwede fighting for his own political life and playing politics with Eskom, given that he's behind in the race mm -hmm. for the chairmanship of the ANC. But be that as it may, that I think really was the final straw. And it really has been a number of straws that have been landing, I think, on the CEO's back and eventually, you know, the camel, camel can't bear it anymore. But I mean, uh, the whole job in itself is, is, is a very difficult one. And we must remember that uh, when uh, Andre de Reiter took it over, he entered a few months later, we entered COVID, <coughs> which was traumatic for the whole country and including Eskom, which was an essential service. So you had to navigate that period. Um, he, it also comes, you know, you enter when the coal fleet, I think they didn't realize the, the, the sort of really dramatically poor state of the coal fleet mm. when he took over the job. I think a realization during that COVID period of just how bad it was. Uh, initially they thought they could, you know, through maintenance efforts, turn things around and limit load shedding within nine months. And all we've seen is it getting um, dramatically worse and worse. I think the, the procurement systems in state-owned companies are very difficult to navigate when you need to do things properly and urgently, uh, on a, especially on an urgent basis. You just can't get the spares, for instance. So you mobilize crews, and then the spares are not available to do the, the actual work on the ground. So people are left uh, with, we've left with more capacity out for initially planned maintenance, that then moves into unplanned maintenance, the continual breakdown of the fleet. But plus we enter, you know, uh, uh, he entered at a time when you have to clean up after years of state capture, of deep state capture, which had really embedded itself. Uh, I think that was also the surprise, how embedded it was throughout the system, particularly in the supply, coal supply chain, but throughout power stations. And uh, there's, a, there's a sort of a business management saying that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And the culture was, was really toxic at some of these stations and was really eating in uh, to this plan to turn around. And then we must understand the scale of the turnaround mm -hmm. that w we're talking about, the restructuring of Eskom uh, into three parts, the unbundling. This would have taken a normal corporate, you know, s in a corporate JSE setting, that would have occupied your entire mind, just the restructuring. And that was only one small part of the job, um, as would the debt crisis. That would have occupied a normal CEO's uh, mind 100%, but we had the failing coal fleet, uh, the, the flight of skills, the sabotage within the organization. These are all just straws adding pressure to this, uh, onto the CEO who's the sort of most visible personality within the utility. Plus the politics became toxic and I think it became clear quite early on that the, the, when the new board, board was in, uh, appointed in October that the alignment that was there previously was no longer there. It was particularly evident when the board said that the priority was returning the energy availability factor of the coal fleet to 75%, which I think any uh, sensible person who's been watching Eskom over the last few years realized was a, t a totally impossible task, setting up the executive for failure. I mean, they have moderated the stance somewhat, but not publicly. But you know, it was really not, uh, uh, not a supportive action. And the fact that there was lack of support following the, the reckless statements of the energy minister, I think just, you know, the writing was on the wall. So I think that the, the, the position became untenable. But we must understand that Andre de Reiter is probably the first CEO out of the last 11 that actually got his head around 
a, a progressive vision for where Eskom had to go that was in line with government policy. And government policy was that Eskom, at the generation level, was going to be split off and there was going to be lots of competition. The transmission was going to be the core of the business and then distribution was also going to be competing with municipal distributors and other distributors. And that whole business was being aligned to government policy, which I think it seemed like a lot of ministers didn't really know what the government policy was, but it was actually, and it was a very progressive stance. Uh, and it was also the first CEO that understood how the utility needed to transition in terms of, you know, the whole thing that overlies an Eskom CEO or Eskom at the moment is the most fundamental change to the electricity supply industry in a century. And that's being driven initially by the decarbonisation efforts. But what that triggered is extremely uh, low cost new technologies that are different from the old technologies and those are variable renewable energy technologies. So that is what's going to drive the future of all energy systems, not only in South Africa, but around the world. And you can see it in the, the various uh, procurements around the world, the level of of acquisition of renewable energy relative to any of the other technologies is just, uh, it's just streaks ahead, streets ahead. So he understood that and therefore also put in place a process to say, well, we're going to be decommissioning coal, we're going to be entering into transition. Let's try and do this in a way that's least disruptive for communities and, and, and employees. So, you know, brought the whole just energy transition concept, which has been knocking around all over the world for many years, but right to the fore, right to the heart of Eskom. It's a very progressive stance that was taken. So, it, so it's, it's, it, it is a sad thing that, you know, we're only really at the start of that journey and now it's going to be disrupted again. And what is the outlook for Eskom? Well, the outlook for Eskom <coughs> is very difficult, you know, the, it's a distraction again that you know, the, all the board, or the shareholder, etc., have to pay so close attention to finding a replacement now for uh, Andre de Reita at a time when it should be all hands on deck. Uh, there should be, you know, 100% full alignment around w what is needed to recover the coal fleet as best as possible and to let those units that can't be recovered go. And to be honest about it and um, not to try and have and make Eskom great again, Trump style uh, a CEO, that's not going to happen. And it's also not appropriate for where the energy and the electricity supply industry is moving. As I mentioned earlier, it's moving in a different direction. Uh, it's going to require, m uh, it's going to involve many more actors right down to my rooftop at home, which should be feeding into the grid. It's a, it's a whole different uh, electricity supply industry that's emerging. And we need someone who's able to navigate that and not be take turn back the clock 25 years and trying to make Eskom great again, but to try and make Eskom fit for purpose. Mm. And that's going to be a hard ask. Obviously, society's clamoring for an engineer. The engineers that have proceeded uh, under a rate have not held themselves up in any glory. In fact, some of them have been the most corrupt and toxic individuals to Eskom that have le led to this uh, to this current load shedding crisis, and uh, so we, but it seems society is going to demand an engineer. So we're going to have to find an engineer that, that hopefully, is able to take uh, the vision uh, of a progressive restructuring of this uh, electricity supply industry, where Eskom is but a part, and really the future of Eskom is really going to be about the transmission grid and the system operation. That's really the heart of Eskom, and that's where why. Sadly, you know, the journey was just starting in terms of the unbundling and sadly we still don't have an independent board for the system, the transmission company that, uh, that has sort of been divisionalized but we still don't have proper legal separation. That's going to be key to ensuring that we transition in a progressive way that doesn't put our economy at new risk. Mm -hmm. We can see the European Union this week have, have moved ahead with their carbon border adjustment mechanisms we are a very open trading economy. That is our biggest trading partner. And if we don't decarbonize our energy system and make it more in line with what the needs of economies that are aggressively decarbonizing, we're going to lose out. And we're also going to lose out on the opportunities of the transition because we've got some of the best wind and solar resources in the world, which makes us an ideal location, um, not just to supply 
clean electricity to households and businesses and at a lower and lower cost because this is the cheapest new form of electrons that come into the system. But it also gives us an opportunity to use that competitive advantage to, to produce a new energy carrier that is going to be in demand uh, increasingly, especially in hard to abate sectors, and that's green hydrogen. Obviously, don't, we probably won't be exporting green hydrogen per se, but you'll be produ producing green hydrogen here and then putting it into some sort of other commodity such as green ammonia, green ethanol, sustainable aviation fuel, green steel, and exporting it. And we need those markets to remain open to us. And if we continue or take Eskom approach of turning back the clock 25 years or, and making Eskom great again, we are going to lose that opportunity. And there is concern about non-ESCOM supply relief. That's a huge concern. I mean, you know, we know that ESCOM has been calling for 6,000 megawatts of non-ESCOM supply uh, so that just to give them the breathing space to maintain the coal fleet and allow it to retire where necessary, mm. you know, with some dignity, not just falling over like we're seeing at the moment. You know, so you need space in the system to do that maintenance, that deep maintenance, so as to stabilize the system. Now we're relying on independent power producers and uh, the, this, the way the game has been structured has been very much around a centralized auction process that is run by the D Department of Mineral Resources and Energy through the IPP office. And you know, crucially, we need that core, that heart of Eskom that I spoke about, the system operator and the grid. That needs to be in place, that is the that is the key to unlocking the transition. And because there's so much focus on generation, rightfully so, because things are collapsing, and money's been flowing to generation, there's been an underinvestment in the grid, uh, and it's now coming home to roost, seriously. In the, and we saw it with the, uh, the latest bid window, where only five projects were able to uh, be named as preferred bidders. Out of over 50 that bid, not one wind project, and no projects in the Cape provinces, northern, and, and these are the high potent renewables provinces, the Western Cape, the Eastern Cape, and uh, the Northern Cape, not one project came through that system. And it's basically come down to there's no grid access. And it also came down to a mismanagement, I think, or poor management of a reform that's very important. And that reform is to allow a distributed generation, which is plant, people that are going to enter bilaterals with big companies and on power purchase agreements, on private power purchase agreements, but th they'll wheel through the grid. They use that, that delay mm. in the process uh, to rather get their projects to the top of the list. Now, if those projects come in on time and ahead of what we would have had with REAP, it will help. It will help the load shedding situation. But it's not ideal. This thing should have been managed better. There should have been a better queuing system. Uh, and I think to prejudice those participating in a national program now brings into question whether the national program is going to survive. So yes, there's a big question about non eskom supply now, and we need to be doing this at a massive pace. We need to be adding sort of this three gigawatts a year of electricity just to close the gaps mm -hmm. that, are that are currently left by a failing coal fleet and that are going to be left by a decommission, a formally decommissioned, that's currently decommissioning itself, but a formally decommissioned coal fleet, which we it cannot be extended. This, it's, you know, it's, it's really in a bad state, but we've made commitments internationally in terms of this, but also in terms of our own law, they can't be extended because if they were to be extended, we'd have to put in massive environmental protection systems that are going to cost billions of rands, which Eskom doesn't have, mm -hmm. and the consumer's not prepared to pay for through the tariff. So it's not an option to extend the life of these power stations, and I hope the new Eskom CEO, whoever that person is, really understands that from day one. Now, also of concern is NASA's postponement of the tariff decision. Uh, I didn't mention one of the, the big headwinds that's faced every CEO, but uh, also during this period of Andre de Reiter, has been this relationship that has become increasingly toxic between, or antagonistic, I think toxic, between NASA uh, and Eskom. And, you know, the way Eskom under, C, uh, under the Rato has had to try and has navigated it is actually to take the regulator to court on numerous occasions and has won every single case because the regulator is not actually acting in terms of its own rules and it's, it's becoming a problem. 
the last court case was basically to tell MRSA to use a methodology that is tried and tested, that is known, uh, and not to try and introduce a new methodology that is based on principles without an actual formula. And they actually had to go to court to get a determination. And the court said, obviously, you can't, you know, how are we going to come up with a tariff if there's it's just these broad based principles? You need to use uh, the existing methodology. So they got that earlier this year. And as part of that court judgment, the court said, but you also must have a decision by Christmas Eve, 24th of December, there has to be a decision. So eventually, NERSA got the consultation papers out around the latest tariff, the MYPD5 it's called, uh, got it out and we had very badly attended public hearings during September, the worst ever, I think. Uh, and then uh, basically from September until this week, we've heard nothing. They've been having thought leadership uh, panels, uh, webinars at NERSA, but actually we haven't heard anything about this key decision until yesterday. And the decision of yesterday was to kick the can down the road for another, hopefully not past 24th of December because then they'll be on the wrong side of a court order, but to kick it down the road further uh, because there were 14 issues that the, the energy regulator, which is the highest decision making body, it's not it's not made up of only full-time NERSA people, it's, it's full-time and part-time. They had a lot of questions, and these are questions that we've had a few months that should have been answered. And it is a, it is a very difficult decision because just by implementing what is court-ordered because of the, you know, the cases that Eskom has taken, including the clawback of 69 billion of equity injection that was wrongly taken off Eskom's allowable revenue those, all those years back, and now we have to claw it back, is going to mean a high double digit increase, probably close to 20%. Never mind Eskom's request to run the open cycle gas turbines at a much higher rate, which is, as we can see with the lights going off this week, that's the lack of diesel. You know, the diesel has been softening the blow, mm -hmm. but what, what if you don't have diesel bringing in 2,000 or 2 gigs of additional electricity when you need it? Well, we've got two extra stages of load shedding, and now Kuburg's gone off. Mm. You know, one's gone off for 200 days, so that adds another stage. So that's three load uh, stages of load shedding. So we, well, while we should be theoretically in stage two, we don't have diesel, we don't have nuclear, so we're in stage five. You know, that's where we're at at the moment. So the diesel decision that NERSA has to make is a very difficult one because Eskom's saying they're gonna need, they're gonna have a much lower EAF from their coal fleet which is really what is happening. We hit the lowest EAF in the history this week at I think 52% EAF, it's never been that low. And to compensate, we're gonna have to have a higher capacity factor out of uh, the, the diesel plants. Now, what's the cost recovery for that? It, NERSA has to make, so now if you're a NERSA <laughs> official, ahead of a big ANC conference, it's quite a difficult call to make. So I think the decision was rather not make that call this mm. week. And uh, the decision was quite shocking me because they've had a lot of time to make this decision, was to delay. And I just hope that they meet the court order, but it's not a good sign to be going right to the end, right to Christmas Eve and only announcing. So I think really NERSA does need to get its house in order. Thanks for speaking with us, Terence. Pleasure. That's it for today. Join us again next time for more news analysis. To subscribe to Crema Media's Engineering News and Mining Weekly, please email subscriptions at cremamedia.ca.za. And don't forget to listen to the audio version of our Engineering News daily email newsletter.